Christ is risen. But before he rose, he had to suffer many things. Put yourself in her shoes. I'm thinking of a wife and a mother who heard some terrible news this last week. Imagine, imagine getting this news. Her, her husband, her son were working at a hospital in Kabul when they were met with gunfire from an Afghan police officer and left dead. How do you feel if you were her, and what would you want to hear to be comforted? In fact, if you, if you saw this woman, what would you say to her? Now imagine being her. I'm thinking of one of my high school classmates, when she was a senior, her mom, who was just over 40, was diagnosed with cancer and put into hospice care. And every time this senior girl, senior in high school, went and visited her mother, she noticed that her face lost a couple shades in its complexion, began to fade until she died. How do you feel if you were this, this girl in high school, this senior? What would you want to hear? And if you, if you met her, what would you tell her? What, what comfort would you offer her? I'm going to ask you to imagine one more time that Thursday early morning before the sun rose, you're one of six people leaving a recording studio, and as you walk out the doors, you're met by a man who is carrying a gun who robs all of you and shoots two of your co-workers. What type of questions would you have about God? How, how could he allow this to happen? These, these, these are some instances that we look at where we might start to doubt God. The Bible tells us to fear, love, and trust in him above all things. But why does he allow these things to happen? Crime, murder, our loved ones being taken early. It makes us wonder, is God really in control? Does he care about me? Is he working things for my good? When, when there's so much suffering in this world, there's so much suffering in my life. The Apostle Peter wrote the verses which serve as our meditation this morning to men and women 2,000 years ago who had some of the very same questions, the same doubts about God. These, these men and women lived under the Roman Empire which persecuted Christians for their beliefs. Many of these men and women were held at spear point at different times by Roman soldiers. They were taken from their homes and and thrown in the, arena, in the arena to serve as gladiators and to face lions. These Christians 2,000 years ago probably had these same questions of doubt as they were experiencing this, this persecution and suffering. So Peter wrote them this letter, and he started it with these verses, reminding them of what God does do for us. He first points to God's mercy. He says in verse 3, In his great mercy, he has given us new birth. And when he says new birth, you can think that God has given you a second chance. Think of it this way. If you were one of those people who was robbed by that man in Atlanta, and you happened to run into him again, I could hardly imagine that you would invite him to your house you would say, make yourself at home. You're like, you're like part of the family now. Just, just the opposite. We'd, we'd view him as an enemy. And see, sometimes when we have these questions of doubt about God, we, we begin to sinfully view him as our enemy. But he has great mercy for us. Even though we have doubted him, he has shown mercy by giving us a second chance. He's made us sons and daughters 
of himself. And he's invited us into his kingdom of believers through this new birth. Now what is this new birth? Jesus said, nobody can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. This new birth that Peter is talking about is baptism. At baptism, you were connected to Christ's death. Christ's death, which put to death all the sins of the world, even the sins of when you doubt God, when you view him as the enemy, when you doubt him and fail to trust in him to work things out in your life. Baptism put to death all of those sins. And in baptism, it created faith. It worked faith that clings to that promise that God works for all things. God works good in all things for those who love him. And Peter continues to tell us what else we received at this new birth, at baptism. He says, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Through our baptism, we're connected to Christ's resurrection. Now, there's, there's one word in this passage that we're going to look at. It's the word hope. What, what is our living hope? When the Bible uses the word hope, it doesn't, it doesn't use it the same way we might. For instance, I, I hope it doesn't rain this afternoon, or I hope I get an A on this test. No, that, that leaves way too much room for doubt, too much room for uncertainty. When the Bible uses hope, it's something that's certain. When the Bible uses hope, it's more like, I know this for sure. I am certain of this. And perhaps no human being knew hope better than a man from the Old Testament. His name was Job. Just about everything in his life was taken from him. His family, his cattle, parts of his property were destroyed. And to make matters worse, he was afflicted with these painful sores that covered him from head to toe. Throbbing, painful sores. Yet in the middle of all these trials, in the middle of all these sufferings, he expressed his living hope. He said, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand upon the earth. And even after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not, not another for me. How my heart yearns within me Job knew this living hope that he had in Jesus. This was, he lived a thousand years before Jesus walked the earth. And when he said this, it was like he was right there with Jesus when he said to Peter and the rest of his disciples, because I live, you also will live. Job knew the sure and certain hope of his resurrection at the last day. He, know, he knew that he would never perish. And that's the exact same hope that we have in Jesus' resurrection. Just like Job, we can say with that confidence, with that certainty, I know that even though when I watched my mother die and her eyes close, closed as she breathed her last, I know that she opened those eyes again to see Jesus, her Redeemer, in all his glory. With certainty, we can say, even though my body gets afflicted with, with illness, with terminal illness and that of my loved ones. I know that their body will be made new on the last day and they will walk in the presence of Jesus. With certainty, we can say, even though I will eventually age and wither and die and return to the ground, I know that I will rise from that grave and will live eternally. How my heart yearns within me. That is the certainty that we have in our living hope in Jesus. A living hope that never perishes. Because we will never perish. And, and it doesn't just end there. The, the Apostle Peter keeps going on. He says, we were given new birth into an inheritance too. When parents pass away, they usually leave something for their children. It can, be, it can be jewelry, like a gold watch or a pearl necklace. It can be an expensive sports jacket or a dress. It could be their house, and most of the time they usually leave behind a sum of money that's divided among their children. 
But this is hardly, hardly a perfect inheritance. Think about it. Over time on this earth, the gold watch can tarnish, the pearls can discolor, the sports coat or the dress can fade, and the house will need maintenance as the paint fades and chips and peels, the foundation cracks. The inheritance that our parents here on this earth leaves us is imperfect. The inheritance that our Heavenly Father gives us, our Heavenly Father who gives to us His children, who He gave new birth to at baptism, is perfect. Peter describes it as an inheritance, an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Kept in heaven for you. Now picture this. When you rise from your grave on the last day, you will see this inheritance as you walk through the ever bright, shining, pearly gates of heaven and enter the kingdom of heaven. You will see the perfection of this inheritance as you walk down the gold paved streets of Jerusalem, which can never tarnish as you enter the mansion in which Jesus has prepared a room just for you, a mansion which can never fade, which can never, never crumble, which can never fall apart. And this inheritance never perishes either. The kingdom of God in heaven will never perish, and you will live in it eternally. That's our living hope that we have on this earth that never perishes. And that's, that's a future hope that, that comes at the end of our lives. But you might still be wondering, what about the here and now? What about the daily lives? What about the things that happen on this earth? The crime, the suffering, all the trials that we experience. Peter spoke to that as well. At one time, he said, we must go through many hardships to enter, enter the kingdom of God. Our life on this earth still includes tragedy, crime, suffering. As Peter said, we must go through many hardships. But he talks about this firm advantage we have in life. He says, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, may be proved genuine. When I read these words, I'm reminded of something that Martin Luther once wrote. He said, to discover the strength of your faith is like finding an unknown, buried, hidden treasure chest in your backyard buried deep. Now when you think about this, when, when these sufferings and trials enter your life, that's where you turn to, is your faith, your faith for comfort. If life was easy, it would hardly require any faith. But it's at these hardest times that our faith turns to the Word of God and digs deep for its everlasting promises which never perish. Our faith clings with a white-knuckled grip to our living hope that never perishes. And as we live out our days in faith, God also gives us another blessing, something else that doesn't perish. He gives us security. He puts it this way. Peter puts it this way. Through faith, we are shielded by God's power. Now I think about this protection that God offers by a shield this way. Back at my parents' house in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, just a couple doors down there, there lives a police officer. And when I lived there the last couple summers, I'd, I'd come back from work at about the same time he did and see the patrol car in the parking lot, just two houses down. And it always gave me a sense of security, knowing that there was a law enforcement agent right there. My, my community felt safe. Yeah, there were, there were still a couple misdemeanors, but I felt, I felt very secure, very safe. And that's a good way of describing the protection that our God gives to us. There, there may still be things that, 
cause us to raise questions in our mind as we experience suffering, as we experience trials. But it's never anything that we can't handle. When the fiercest attacks come, God puts up the shield and blocks those, those very tough attacks on our life. Through faith, we are shielded by God's power. We have protection, protection that never perishes in our life. Now the second week of Easter, our Easter joy continues. We see that through Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, we have a living hope, a living hope that we will never perish. We will rise from our graves and live eternally. We have a living hope, a very real hope, in an everlasting kingdom in heaven which will never perish, where we will live and never perish. And we have a living hope in God's protection. Christ is risen. He is risen Alleluia. Amen. Please stand. We'll con confess our common Christian faith with the words of the Nicene Creed on page 9 in the service folder. 